Alan Fletcher released the EP Dispatches last year and now has a new album called The Point. He juggles music with acting as once again he is appearing in Neighbours or will be appearing in Neighbours and he's also about to embark on a UK tour. Going to ask him about all of it. Hi, Alan. Hi, how are you, Sophie? Great to hear you. It's great to see you again. And uh, I will start, though, not talking about The Point. I'm going to ask you about your Tamworth Country Music Festival because you had a few shows. How did they go? Well, it was, it was an absolute ripper. I, I really felt like Tamworth was back to normal this year. Um, April last year was terrific, but it was shortened, as you know. And um, I think there was a, still a sense of slight disquiet about the place, you know, the COVID was such. I mean, COVID hasn't disappeared, but I just think people were a bit more relaxed about it this year. And they were certainly very, very keen to get out there amongst the uh, amongst the crowds and and really have a good a great uh, celebration so i had a fabulous time i sang at a charity concert country turns pink uh, i my wife and i compared americana in the park which was oh, huge success right. there was um, at least 7000 people apparently in the park so that was great and then d- did a ton of little gigs around town before my press uh, album launch on the tuesday night and then just a few a few little guest appearances after that, but mainly seeing some of my favourite artists like, you know, Shane Nicholson, Melody Moko and others. Um, so, yes, a, a, a glorious week, I have to say, really enjoyable. I was about to ask if you had time to see anyone. You clearly did get to some gigs, but it's the nature of that festival that artists like you are flitting around quite a lot. Yeah, you've got really got to be a, a pretty choosy about how you do it. And sometimes you you actually do flip between you watch half of one gig and then the second half of another, you know. But in Americana at Tamworth too, it's quite centralised a lot of it around the press basement bar, the the Tamworth Hotel. Um, So it's it's quite a sort of centralised genre in a way, whereas a lot of the big country music is out in in the bigger bigger clubs. So um, it's pretty easy to stumble from one venue to the next. (laughs) Yes, for those who haven't been to Tamworth, those venues are on the same block. In fact, they're not even a whole block apart. Um, So it is easy to stumble. Now we will talk about the point, which is about... I was thinking about the themes of it. It's about love and death and faith and friendship, I think. And I was wondering if you intended to make a philosophical album. Oh, it's a really good question. I, I have a tendency to philosophise, yeah. but also when I'm working with people like Lachlan Bryan from The Wilds, who's producing me, and Damon Caparella, Lachlan is, has an exceptional songwriting talent and he he is very, very good at helping you distill complex thoughts uh, in in not simple ways, but in um, elegant ways. Uh, and as a result, I think, because I, I do tend to think probably a little bit too deeply about things sometimes, um, but also I have a comedy aspect, as you will know from songs like How Good Is Bed and, and so I forth. have a question about that song. <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, so I, I kind of, I feel like, it's fair to say that I, uh, John Prine is pretty much my my muse uh, in a way. I mean, John Prine's my sort of go-to hero in country music and Americana. And if you look at Prine's catalogue, it's there, there's enormous similarities in the fact that, you know, very large themes like Hello in there and Sam Stone and so forth. And then you'll get, you know, uh, glorious comedy songs like, you know, Sabu meets the, at the twin, the twin cities, and uh, and Donald and Lydia, and so forth. So, I do mix it up a bit, but yes, big themes. The point was, the point itself, the song, the point started out as an exploration of the fact that I think we we all search for the point. What is the point of, of, of anything really, and. Uh, for a lot of people, I think the point uh, of life is quite neat for them because they they can they can go to religion and and uh, they have a point laid out for them, and that's that's great. I don't decry that in the slightest. It just that it's not my way of looking at the world. So I thought I, I want to do a song that contrasts my the search for my point mm-hmm. against the fact there is a ready-made point waiting there if you chose it. Yeah. Uh, and the song wasn't going particularly well until I realised I was actually writing a love song. Oh. Um, so, and now I'm very, very happy with it. Yeah, it's a, it is a great song. And you mentioned uh, Lachlan and Damien, and it seems just from what I've read about this this album and, and your work with them, that the album might have actually grown organically out of your association with them rather than you saying, well, I have these songs and I, and I want to get them out of the world. Can you help me? Yes, exactly. They said to me, come to me come to us with your songs mm-hmm. and I went down there with a few and they, they picked the ones I really liked we recorded them and then 
we started to, to write together. I started to give them more ideas, which they helped me evolve. And, you know, we got through, we got, we got to our EP stage. Mm -hmm. I was amazed. I didn't think that I'd have that sort of body of material. And then uh, we recorded some songs for The Point. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we together organically discovered my voice and what mm -hmm. I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it. So we actually went back and re-recorded quite a few of the songs with different keys and different arrangements. Um, and that's a, it's beautiful to work in that way. You know, there was no pressure from Lachlan and Damien to say, no, no, let's get this, let's get this out, let's get it done. You know, they, we all agreed that no, we wanted to give this a lot of love and care and attention. And it sounded to me like your singing voice had changed a bit between the EP and the album. And I wonder if it's because you were singing to them in a sense, like you felt like you knew them better and they were right there in the studio with you. Cause there is a sense of you singing to someone on this album. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. You hear that. Um, and that's very much the case. The one thing that as the, probably the slight downside of being of my acting background is I tend to uh, uh, over theatricalize sometimes mm -hmm. with lyrics, you know, and, um, you know, in one case of one song, you know, Damien uh, Lachlan said to me, look, it's all great, but you've got to get the pantomime out of the song. And as you know, so much of, of what Americana and country music in its storytelling is exactly that. It's one person telling another person in the room a story. Mm -hmm. uh, when you listen to Guy Clark, you feel like Guy Clark singing to you, uh, just you, you know, uh, Chris Christopherson, same deal. And, um, and so, yeah, that, that was what I started to learn. And by lowering the keys and getting a little bit more uh, storytelling about it and, and taking theatricality out of it and not using so much of my high voice, mm -hmm. um, it helped me achieve that. But it is hard to unlearn your training. I mean, you've been an actor for a really long time. Uh, did it feel almost like you were cracking yourself open a bit, having to go back to the start? I did, but that's what exactly what I'm used to doing as an actor. As an actor, I'm actually used to taking direction from directors to right. say, um, you know, look, that's great, but let's do it this way now. And and so being adaptable is the hallmark of being a, an actor. And uh, yeah, so exactly the same case in music, I think, you know, if the producers are saying to you, it's great, but they're gently prodding you in another direction. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not the sort of person who stands up and goes, oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it your way. You know, there's, a, there's my way or the highway. I sit there and say, okay, let's try that. I mean, you know, you get plenty of takes at things and okay. sometimes what you what you think is great, you listen to it later and go, uh, not so great. Yeah. Um, and you try it again, different way. Uh, sometimes I would actually record it at the studio, do a vocal, and then later I wouldn't like my vocal, so I would record at home right. uh, and do a big bulk of home records and then send the files back down to Damien to to see if he could comp up something a little bit more interesting and that worked quite effectively as well so do you have quite a good home studio set up it's not too bad at all i've got a lovely uh, opr mic um which is made here in in melbourne a uh, ribbon microphone which is really nice and i have <laughs> in my office i hang two dooners from the cupboard doors uh which creates a very nice little little uh, protected sound uh scape but mercifully, too, of course, you know, um, the wonders of, um, of uh, the, the, the computers these days that you, know, you can hand in a vocal that can be that can be improved dramatically if, it's, if there's problems. Yeah. And of course, this was this is all an outgrowth, really, of the past few years. The pandemic had had serious bad effects. But one of the good effects has been the ability, I think, for people to record from home. And it just seemed quite normal. Yes, well, a good, very dear friend of mine, um, Elise Platt, who, uh, 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 of course, sung on the single Sorry is the Word. Uh, during lockdown, she created a, a project called Bandouche where she sang covers in her bathroom. Uh, and they're acoustic and they're like, it's like the natural echo of a bathroom, you know. Yeah. So uh, they're not studio created. And that, that in itself is what makes that album so in, uh, interesting. Now, you mentioned the song How Good Is Bed. And yeah. it is, I, I'm, I may perhaps there are other songs out there that attributes to bed, but you do a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> when did you get the idea for that? My wife and I have, well, well, my wife for nine years worked in breakfast radio and you know what radio can be like, Sophie. And it's, it was very hard. Um, I'm sorry, there's an alarm going off. I don't know why. It's very arduous. And, uh, and she was very patient with it, but 
we would just look at each other on the weekend and go, oh, how good is bed? You know, just to have a lie-in mm. is the best thing you could ever imagine. So, um, yeah, glorious, absolutely glorious. How good is bed is our kind of like mantra. Yeah. So for me, I was kind of fishing around to say, you know, we all have a favourite place. And it could be a beautiful beach or a waterfall or something. But for me, just lying horizontally, maybe reading the paper or even just having a little afternoon schnooze, whatever, it's perfect. Yeah, well, it's a good uh, it's a good anthem, I think, for, for pretty much everyone. Just put it on when you're planning to go to sleep or not. Yes, so, exactly. Um, now, uh, contrasting with How Good Is Bed, there is a really moving song called Hey You, and the, the title of the song doesn't really indicate how moving it is, which is fine. Um, but in it, you're talking to someone who's died, asking if they're still watching over you, and that mm. person is your mother. Um, That's right. From the track description. So I'm wondering if you felt that creating that song actually was a way of keeping that connection with her. No question. No question. You know, my mum my, my was a spiritual guide for me and she was a spiritual healer. She started life as a nurse working in modern medicine. But uh, in the late 60s, she, she moved into spiritualism and spiritual healing. So, in fact, as a child, I was treated by, by spiritual healers all my life. Uh, I had asthma as a child. Mm-hmm. but I was not allowed to be told I had asthma by any doctors. Okay. Um, and I was treated basically by meditation. And in fact, I didn't ever have an asthma attack or take any medication for asthma until I was in my 20s. And that was kind of after a doctor had said I had asthma. Right. Um, so it's kind of, you know, it's funny like that. Mum always knew if I was in trouble. She always knew if she, if I needed her. We weren't in contact all the time, but she would ring just when I, I needed her to. And she always said that I, she'd be there for me afterwards, after she'd gone. And so I kind of hang on to that. Yeah, It's a very attractive thought. But Hey You is kind of a philosophical song saying, well, you know, are you there? Um, I, I would, would love it if you were. I miss you. Um and will you be waiting for me when I turn up? It's not sort of going, you know, I need you to be necessarily. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's an inquiry to, to, to the afterlife to say, you know, what, what does go on in there? And are you still there? Are you looking after me? I do feel that she looks up over me, I have to say. And, and I have a beautiful picture of her sits in, uh, uh, sits in my, my bedroom on the shelf. And when I wake up every morning, it's the first thing I see. So, I, well, so, apart from my wife. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I can see mum and just go, oh, this is, yeah, beautiful. Well, energy is not created or destroyed, as we know. That's that's a law of the universe, so mm. it has to go somewhere. And um, it's interesting that she was a, an, an energy healer because energy medicine is becoming increasingly popular now. She was clearly mm. quite ahead of her time. Mm. Oh, totally. Yes, she, she was. Uh, there was a woman by the name of Barbara White who was kind of the head of all this, and uh, um, and it, it, there were a lot of practitioners working with Barbara. So it was a big thing in Perth, actually, to be honest. And then down in the southern part of Western Australia, which is kind of uh, one section of it in the Prongrups, was quite a, quite quite nimble in a, in a way, um, and and very very progressive in its uh, natural healing. So I'm thinking with that upbringing, that awareness that uh, how energy moves, uh, I guess meditation might have been around that as well. But you are in two professions, music and acting, where being present is really important in order to to achieve your craft. So I'm wondering if you learnt things as a child that you've carried into both of those. Well, I, I certainly the, the, the things I've learnt about uh, from mum, I suppose, and from my childhood is, is that the ego is not really your friend mm-hmm. um the the ego will will block uh, chances to move forward um if you look at the world and say um oh i'm i'm how dare you say that or i'm insulted by that or are you impugning my reputation or are you suggesting i'm not good enough then that will block you from the possibility of growing um not, notwithstanding that, there's nothing, nothing wrong with having a bit of pride. There's nothing wrong with being proud of what you're doing and, and saying, well, actually, I'm happy with it. I'm, I'm not going to change it because I'm actually happy with it. Mm-hmm. But uh, being open to the possibility of change, I think, is really important, uh, particularly in the relationships. You know, um, uh, uh, the one with song, Sorry is the Word, the original song, was actually about the fact that I think if, if we knew how to say sorry more often, mm-hmm. more relationships would last a bit longer, I think. And, um, yeah, so that's that. That's kind of the way. I think that's what I got from mum, really, is just being just being a little bit calm about the way the world treats you. 
Yeah. And also on the album, you, you know, that aspect of uh, somebody being responsible for the things <laughs> yeah. in a relationship, somebody's, somebody's not put the washing out, somebody's not washed up the dishes, whatever it is. Yeah. Get, get rid of the blame. I mean, you, we, my wife and I turned it into a bit of a joke. Um, mm. And, and, and we've, we, I think we've both realised because we make a bit of a joke of it, you know, somebody left the gas on or somebody did this, somebody did that, that it's got a lightness to it, that you actually, it diffuses the situation, you know, instead of someone getting really cross and going, you know, you know, you know, you did that, don't you? You know, you left the gas on. It becomes like, hey, somebody's left the gas on here. Yeah. Um, you know, the house could have burnt down. You do, you are you thinking about that? And the other one goes, yeah, well, somebody better not do that again. Just, yeah. And it diffuses it. And makes it a bit of a game, and um, it's certainly done us a lot of good, I think. Yeah, it's a it's yeah, it's a good policy. Might put it into effect myself. Now you are heading to the UK for some shows, yeah. uh, and you are also back on Neighbours. So everyone thought Neighbours was finished. You thought Neighbours was finished. It's been picked up again, and and you are about to re inhabit this character. Uh, but before that, you go to the UK. Now, are you taking a band, or is the Wilds going to be your band? The Wilds will be my band. So uh, Lachlan, uh, Lachlan's coming. Riley, Catherine will be coming. Sean Ryan will be coming. My wife Jen plays keys with me. So you know we'll be a five piece in the UK. And Lachlan and Sean and uh, Riley will play a wild set before me mm -hmm. uh, on on every gig bar one. It's going to be a gorgeous tour. It's been beautifully put together by our agent Bob Patterson, but it is twelve straight dates. And then a couple of days off, and then I do a gig on my own. So yeah, twelve days on the road, um, living the musician's life is is uh, going to be challenging because you know it's a uh, it, it really is a testing regime. But oh, I cannot wait. I cannot wait. I've done a few gigs in the UK. The audiences love Americana. Mm -hmm. They love country music. So it's um, I'm expecting to have a great time. Yeah, it is quite an extensive run of dates. I was looking at it thinking, woo. You're going to be on the trot. You bet. You bet. Yeah, it's very much a, uh, um, you know, a logistics exercise and mm. you, probably pre-planning is more, you do more pre-planning than you do anything. And if you don't do the pre-planning, it can turn into a complete minefield. Mm. But hopefully when we get on the road, um, it'll be thing. I, I was lucky enough to book a gig in Belfast on the 27th of February because Belfast... I have a lot of fans there and they always say to me, why don't you come to Belfast? Well, because the plane flight tends to get in the way. Well, this time around, I actually was starting in Dublin right. and going up to Belfast. So I thought, beautiful. So we've managed to get a gig in there and um, my, I'm, flying a, I'm flying a wonderful uh, guitarist who I've learned to play with and, and love, Cristiano Porchesi, who's mm. an Italian, who's a master of slide guitar. And... I'm flying him up from London to play the gig in Belfast. Uh, I had to laugh though, Sophie, because he said it was going to cost a fortune for him to bring his guitar right. until we realised that we could book his guitar a seat for 39 <laughs> quid. <laughs> so I had visions of Cristiano flying up to Belfast and, and saying, I'll have, I'll have a gin and soda and, and a beer for the guitar, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good tip, though, for anyone yeah. who's travelling with an instrument. Oh, indeed, it is actually um, a lot of a lot of. Uh, I, I have a I have a Martin um, HD twenty eight guitar, and I'm not taking it this time because I can't bear the possibility of it being shattered. So, um, uh, a lot of guitarists try and get minis, get mini versions of guitars so they can carry them on their back and actually get them on the planes. Yeah. But yes, it, um, unfortunately, it's perilous taking expensive musical instruments around the world. Yeah, and I remember Lachlan, uh, when he came back from a tour last year, it could have been when, when you were with him then as well, he put something on Instagram saying he'd arrived back in Australia and two of his guitars had not. That and, was... well, his J45 got smashed up on the plane. And J45 is a beautiful Gibson guitar. It's been rebuilt a number of times, but it'll, I don't think it'll ever quite be the same. Oh, but, um, yeah, so, you know, very expensive guitars. And, yeah, they give a beautiful sound. They, that's, I mean, that's the, the, the my Martin's the guitar that John Prine played, and uh, yeah. you, know, you can't go past that, can you? But um, I, I'm, I'm being a bit nervous about it. No, fair enough. Now, given that your plans for this year have changed because you'll be back filming Neighbours, um, I imagine you might be thinking a bit differently about music and that perhaps you were going to throw yourself into some more music and now you have other things that you need to think about. Or are you just going to try to combine them? As I'm in, definitely going to at the same time. I'll absolutely combine them. Um, I'll be back at Tamworth next year. That's that's a definite. 
I'm actually hoping, I always plan to go to Nashville this year just, just to go to the Americana Fest. If I got a gig, amazing. It's hard to get one, but I might be able to get one. I mean, you know, everyone's got to play the Bluebird once in their life, right? Yes. Um, and But I don't know. We might do that or I might just embark on a little, because we do get production breaks, so I might just try and embark on a little two-month tour in September, a two-week tour in September. Mm -hmm. I'd really love to get out on the road and play you know, some of the smaller towns around Queensland and New South mm -hmm. Wales uh, and down into Victoria would be fantastic. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm still toying with stitching that together. And then, of course, I get a substantial amount of time off in um, in December and January. And my daughter is an Elvis Presley nut. Mm -hmm. uh, she's 27. She's because of the movie. She's become an Elvis Presley nut. So I promise to take her to parks next year. <laughs> oh, my word. <laughs> yeah. So we'll do parks and then we'll probably tour around a bit more, try and play some gigs and then go to Tammy. Does parks involve you getting into a jumpsuit, though? That's the question. Interesting question. My great pal Ross Wilson had play parks this year. In fact, they, they put a statue up for him. So, you know, I, could, I might be unveiled my way in there. I did actually open the Starry Night Ball one year in Melbourne singing Viva Las Vegas, dressed in a full Elvis suit. So who knows? You know, it's in my blood. Well, that's right. And look, if you go 68 comeback special, it can, you can make it a black suit. Oh, I would, yeah, well, the greatest piece of TV you'll ever see, yeah, that's I think true. can. Um, yeah, I, if, if I can dream is my favourite Elvis song. So that's that's right. that's my dream to sing that song at Parks. Okay. Well, may <laughs> that dream come true. But uh, you you made this musical dream come true with the album. It's it's so strong and also so comforting. Um, that sounds. Oh, hope that doesn't sound odd to say, but it is. No, it's just like no. it's a really reassuring piece of work I think because of the themes you've explored and the way you've created this song so congratulations thank you happy traveling and thank I look you. forward to seeing whatever you come up with next thanks Sophie it's been a great pleasure to talk